not everybody's going to be a winner. I am not a fan of uh, participation medals. And I don't say that lightly. I am a fan of people need to lose to learn how to win. People need to lose to learn how to grow. And people need to learn how to... Here's the reality, man. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. This is episode 192. On today's show, we hear from Master Chip Townsend, an inspiring man with amazing stories and some very impressive feats. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring the best podcast on traditional martial arts twice each week. Welcome. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host as well as the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to all you returning listeners, and welcome to the new listeners out there. Our newsletter list keeps growing because there are a lot of you out there that love the show and want more. In our once or twice week not weekly, monthly, once or twice monthly newsletter, we tell you about our upcoming guests, behind the scenes news about what's going on here at Whistlekick, and we'll even throw you a discount once in a while. Sign up at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And if you don't like it, you can unsubscribe. It's easy. We're not going to spam you. You know, we're constantly innovating and working on new products. That's how our sparring gear got started. That's how a lot of our accessories got started. Just looking around, how can we make stuff better? And now it's time for you to help us pick the next products. Is there a martial arts product you think needs to be invented or one you want to see improved in some way? Reach out to us, let's work together, and see if we can make your ideas a reality. During last year's U.S. Open broadcast on ESPN, I witnessed a man break four baseball bats with his shin. I remember cringing as I watched it, thinking the man who went through such an act had to be an impressive martial artist, sure, but maybe a little bit crazy? Fast forward to now, to today's episode, And I get to speak with that very gentleman, Master Chip Townsend. I came away from our time knowing I was half right. The man is an impressive martial artist, but he's not crazy. What he is, is immensely passionate about what he does, and he's always looking to push his own boundaries. We get into that and a whole bunch of other great stuff. So sit back and listen and enjoy. Master Chip, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, Mr. Jeremy, how are you today, sir? I am humbled and honored to be here, my friend. Hey, no, the, the honor is mine. I appreciate you coming on the show. Really looking forward to talking to you, getting into some of those great stories, talking about some of the things that really make you tick. And we start in the, the way that we kind of have to start, right? Because I don't really know who you are. Some of the listeners will know who you yeah. are. But the majority, at least, yes. will probably have never had the type of conversation you and I are about to have. So let's let's roll it back to the beginning. How did you get going as a martial artist? <laughs> awesome. So uh, when you said that uh, we're getting most people haven't had the conversation like you and I are about to have, that almost makes me a little uncomfortable, Jeremy. I, I'm not sure what to think <laughs> about that. I'm I'm I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> good good question. Uh, how did I get started? So for some reason, whenever I was really young, I just had this kind of. Uh, interest in martial arts as a kid at different times. My mom would say, someday I want you to be a boxer. And I had an uncle that boxed for a period of time. And uh, then uh, the bookmobile, I'm I'm dating myself, would come by our elementary school and I would get books that had pictures of martial arts stuff. And I would look at those pictures and I was just intrigued. I can't really put my finger on like a particular person or movie at that point that that, 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 uh, turned me on to it. But uh, I will say that uh, whenever I was 13, we were driving through the, the town that I'm in, in Texas, and we were driving by the school that I currently own. And I looked over at my mom and I said, Mom, you know, I've always wanted to do that. And she turned around and signed me up. And I've been there ever since. Wow. Wow. So, you know, it's, it's easy to get people into martial arts. Anybody that runs a school knows that, that you kind of have a a pretty constant flow of people coming through the door, but not everyone stays. And, and you know, what's that, yes, that statistic that we all pull out of absolutely nowhere that one out of a hundred students will get their black belt. Something kept you. What was it that kept you in the martial arts? Wow. What is it that kept me? I was so, I tell you what, I think it was, uh, whenever I was three years old, I lost an eye. And so I have a prosthetic eye and, uh, uh, in junior high and elementary, playing sports and playing on the playground, playground with other kids, I wasn't handicapped. I wasn't treated as a handicap, but I was just never really that good 
at other sports. And I lived in the country. I was kind of a country kid, so I was kind of a loner and did my own thing. And uh, I don't know. You know, I, I went in, and, and, and my very first class, Jeremy, was – was literally my five foot nothing Korean instructor who I loved to death absolutely punished me for an hour and uh, uh, I was just hooked and from that point forward I will say this as a blue belt probably a year and a half or so into my training I uh, I hit a point where I wanted to quit and my parents I I went to them and I said you know I'm done I'm just not moving forward and they said you're not done we've invested did too much one you've come too far and you can't see it you're staying with it and uh that was kind of i i can't put a finger on why i stuck with it i just absolutely loved it and i was so driven to be my best at it why do you stay now i stay now because of what it's done for me i think would be the the best answer and for and and, and what it's done for my family because uh, it, I absolutely have no idea. And I think anybody would, that's been in martial arts for years would say the same. I don't know where I would be without it. Uh, it gave me, and, and, and understand I, I had a great set of parents and a great home life. So I didn't have, I don't have a great story of a struggle there, but I, I, it just put so much structure and discipline. It, I, I, it gave me drive, uh, uh, and I absolutely love it. And, and because of that, I am exceptionally passionate about, sharing that with as many people as possible. I mean, it, it's literally my goal to change the world through martial arts. And I know we're going to come back to that as we move forward because yes. someone doesn't say something that powerful and have it show up once. Let's talk about stories. Anybody yes, that's sir. been in the martial arts for more than a little while has stories. And someone like yourself who's been in the martial arts for the majority of your life I'm sure has dozens of stories and hopefully we'll hear more than a few as we weave in and out today. But if someone was to hold a bow staff to your head and say, tell us your best martial arts story, what would that be? Well, I alluded to it already. I think, uh, gosh, I have, again, I have, I have a few that, that stand out. My, my first one was my very first class on the mat. Uh, I'm not sure what my instructor was thinking or doing at that point. Uh, it was 1985, and this guy still carried his little stick around and corrected you by cracking you across the thigh if your horse stances weren't low enough or if your butt stuck up too high doing push-ups. And, and he talked to the parents and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically punish them you know, if they don't work hard and do what I want them to do. And the parents were okay with it. It was great. And so my very first private lesson – he set me right inside the door of, of uh, uh, it's a Korean based style of the dojong. I sit right inside the door. My mom literally sat like five feet away and on an old carpet floor with no mats. And he put me in stretching positions, straddle stretches, hurdler stretches, all these different stretching positions. And for one hour, he, he basically sat on my back and stretched me. I didn't do anything else. I didn't do a punch. I didn't do a kick. I didn't do a single thing. And I remember uh, uh, my mom, you know, she's always been kind of a, you know, a tough lady and grew up on a, a dairy farm and, and working hard and hauling feed and doing a lot of, you know, manual labor kind of stuff. And, and we're driving home and we're probably halfway through a 25 mile drive. And she looks over at me and she says, son, you never have to go back. She said, you know how to hunt, you know how to fish, you, you know how to defend yourself. You had to, you don't have to go back. And I just remember being dumbfounded by that because my mom was not one to say you can quit anything. And I said, man, I, I, I don't know where it came from. Just one of those local colloquialisms, I guess. I just said, man, I wouldn't trade it for all the tea in China. I want to go back. And uh, I, I, I was just hooked. But that was uh, – I don't know. I, I just try to imagine today doing that to a student, their first class. I'm, I'm not sure that that would go over well. You know what I mean? There's certainly been a lot of adaptation for those that teach martial arts as we've moved forward. And in fact, we hear a lot of that sort of controversy, how we teach now versus the way we used to and better or worse. And, or, or, or is it just two sides yes, of the sir. same coin? And, you know, everyone has their opinion on it and I'm not going to bore you Absolutely. with mine. <laughs> absolutely no it's okay oh i, I would i'm honored to hear anything that's uh, a topic for a thursday show yes sir martial arts i mean if you're 
if you're a lifelong martial artist and now you teach martial arts, martial arts, unless you are in the minority, is the biggest part of your life. If people, you know, once you cut out eating and sleeping and, you know, household chores and family, it tends to be martial arts. And then for some people, there's room for a couple other things in their life. Do you have any hobbies or pursuits? Anything else you're passionate about outside of the martial arts? That's a very interesting question, Mr. Jeremy. I uh, uh, I am so consumed, sadly to say, in a way with with my life, passion, and business. Because now that martial arts is my life, it's my living. It's how I provide for my family. Uh, as a matter of fact, my wife is uh, a, a year and a half out of nursing school. She's a registered nurse, and we got married very young. Uh, I was 19; she was 21. We agreed early on. You know, she would uh, she would stay in school. Or I would stay in school back and forth until we finished. And uh, uh, she's a full time martial artist. Helps me to run our schools, our business. Helps to teach. Uh, my oldest daughter, who's graduating from high school in a couple of weeks, is one of our lead young instructors now, and helps run our demo team at our main location. It's so much a part of our life, even family time. My two younger ch- children uh, are are young martial artists, and I don't give them a choice. They they train and. Uh, our family time sometimes ends up being, hey, let's go to the dojo and get on the mat and do some grappling, kickboxing, you know, and we work together. And so, uh, honestly, my my focus is uh, for me, and this, I hope it's okay to say this, uh, uh, I focus on God, my wife, my kids, my family, and my business and team. You know, that's just kind of my order of priorities, I guess I would say. And, and uh, uh, I don't have a lot of hobbies outside of that, so... It's absolutely okay. You can say pretty much anything you want. You know, this is this is an oh, yes, open sir. show, and and this is this is your time. If God is important to you, then yes, then, sir. You know, that's got to weave in and out. That's that's got to be part of our conversation, because otherwise, yes, we're not sir, being to, to you and, and and your story. And you know what? We've had plenty of guests on here that have drawn more than a small connection between their martial arts training and their spirituality. It's it's actually uh, and, a topic that I find really interesting. You know, once you get into the the philosophical elements of martial arts, that personal development piece for a lot of folks, for the yes, way sir. they approach their faith, it it connects quite strongly. Absolutely, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that that uh, I think that God gave us uh, the ability to reason, and He gave us the, the sense to fight back when the time is right. And I think it all connects directly, personally. So, mm. right on. <laughs> I'd like you to tell us about a time in your life that was challenging and how you were able to reflect back on your martial arts and use that to move through or overcome or however you want to explain that to us. Absolutely. So it's going to be a martial arts story. Uh, I think the, the thing that pops into my mind whenever I had to kind of, I guess you would say maybe power through kind of a tough time was uh, the year was 2006 and, uh, uh I had, uh, been very blessed and, uh, t- to be able to win some world titles in breaking and, uh, through the International Sport Karate Association. And in 2006, I was scheduled to go back in July at the world championships and defend what's called the world ultimate breaking championship. <clears throat> and in 2006, in January, so seven months prior, I went to Atlantic City and I was doing a demonstration at the Tropicana Resort and I was doing a bunch of breaking and I did a break. My wife and I were both on stage and keep in mind she's a, a three-time world champion. She breaks baseball bats with her shins and she's a, a very active martial artist. And so we're doing like this dueling banjo show at the Tropicana Resort. She's doing a break. I'm doing a break and the crowd's very engaged and having a great time. And uh, I hit this break that I had done literally probably hundreds of times and I actually severed, I didn't tear, but I severed, somehow severed my Achilles tendon. And uh, uh, at the event, it was a martial arts event, so there are a lot of martial artists there. Uh, I put my foot down and after the break, and when I put my foot down, I can stand on it. And I felt like someone had like either kicked or stabbed me in my calf muscle. And that's because my calf had literally popped up the back of my leg. And uh, anyway, I look across and my wife is standing on the stage and the crowd's going wild and and she's looking at me, and she just kind of has this wide-eyed look, and she's looking at the floor and looking at my face, and I'm like, go ahead, do your next break. Everything's okay. I thought I had just been frogged. I thought I, 
I kicked some bricks and I thought one of them had just hit me wrong on the leg and kind of dead legged my calf basically. So I was just trying to give it a minute to recover. And she looks down again and someone from the side, and it was actually Bob Wall uh, of, of uh, End of the Dragon fame, one of Bruce Lee's nemesis, was standing at the side and he goes, uh, hey, Chip, you're hurt really bad. And I look down and I'm standing in this big puddle of blood. So long story short, severed my Achilles tendon and everybody is like, wow, your career is over. You're done. Uh, you, you, you may not be able to teach. You're definitely not going to be able to train. You're not going to be able to get back to the levels you were before. So <clears throat> it was a long, long trip home. Uh, we had a couple of days after the event that we had kind of intended to get to spend a day going to New York to see some things. And uh, so my team convinced me to get out of the hotel room and push me around in a wheelchair all over New York for a whole day after. Uh, and during the time, I had a lot of think time. Yeah, it was, it was fun. You know, they, they, and they had to encourage me me heavily because I did not want to leave the hotel room. I, it's it's uh, one of those tough things for, I, I guess you can perceive yourself as a tough guy and all of a sudden you're having to have people kind of carry you around, you know? So uh, anyway, with that said, it was a great learning experience. So had a lot of time to think, uh, prayed about it a lot, thought about it a lot. My wife and I discussed it and I kept thinking to myself, everybody thinks I'm done, but there's a golden nugget here somewhere. So here's what I deduced. Uh, I felt like I had really spent a lot of time up to that point focusing on my physical skills, driving my body physically, driving my boundaries physically. And I kind of think that in my world, in my mind, that was God saying, okay, son, it's time to sit down and take a break. It's time for you to, to rebalance your life. And I decided to go back to school. And so uh, I called the university that I had been taking some ongoing classes with and uh, slowly working towards a degree. And I said, what do I need to do to finish? And they said, you need so many classes. And I said, well, I can do that within the next, like two semesters. And so I crushed myself to class uh, during the day. And I would crush myself back to the Taekwondo school in the evenings and sit on the sidelines and coach my classes. And uh, I used that year of recovery time on the Achilles to finish my bachelor's degree in business. Uh, so that was one of those times that kind of that never give up mindset that we really try hard to develop in our in our students uh, uh i think paid off well i i didn't get down when people said you know it's over your career is done this is one of those life you know career ending injuries uh and then the fun part was was uh in 2008 i went back i retrained and rewon the world ultimate breaking championship again if you were to compare yourself before that injury to yourself now what are the major differences in who you are? Uh, I think I'm more optimistic. I've, I've always, I think, been an optimist for the most part. Uh, I've tried really hard over the last, you know, 15, 20 years to really grab a hold of the mindset that no matter how bad something goes, there's a, like I said, I, there's a golden nugget there somewhere. There's, there's something for me to learn. And I think because of that injury and because of that time off at the sidelines, there are a few things. One, I'm better at being optimistic and realizing when things go wrong, it's not the end of the world. There's going to be something positive to find if we just look hard enough. And two, I think I am now a more patient teacher uh, because in, prior to that, I hadn't had any major, major injuries on the mat. And so, uh, you know, I'd broken a toe here. I, I broke a hand fighting it the Olympic training center one time. I, I had some small things, but now when my students have an injury, I think I'm more sympathetic to that and understanding to what they're going through. And I, I, I hope that it made me a better teacher and a better, uh, a, a more patient person, a better, more understanding person. What would your wife say if I asked her that same question about your injury, the before and after? That's a great question. <laughs> what, what, and and, and maybe, maybe I'll have to ask her, you know, uh, listeners, the, the plan is to have yeah. her on the show in the future. But, you know, it's always interesting to me what someone says their spouse would say. Right. Uh, you know, here's the thing. I, I have a very, I, I, I see her this way, and I, I'm sure everyone that has a spouse feels this way. I, I have a very special wife. We've been married for over 25 years, and She's been an absolute uh, gift in my life, and she is the kind of wife that uh, if if I walked in one day and said, honey, I'm going to buy the house next door, 
she would look at me and she would say, why? And I would give her my silly reason and she would say, okay, how are we going to pay for it? Let's make it happen. And now do, I don't do those things, but she's just that supportive of whatever I, I want to go after. And so with that said, <laughs> before the injury and after the injury, I, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, really anything changed that much for her. Uh, but I, I will tell you, I'll give you an example of what my wife is like. So uh, do you mind if I tell you another story related to this? I never mind more stories. Okay. So <clears throat> the year I believe was, uh, 2008, uh, no, I'm sorry. The year was 2005. I won the ultimate breaking world championship in 2004 and five. That's right. So I won the world ultimate breaking championship through the ISK in 2004 and it's a compilation of four divisions. You had, uh, uh, at the time, there was a power kicking division, which I was undefeated in. Every year I competed in. Uh, there was a combat board breaking, which was who can break the most boards in eight seconds using both hands and both feet. There was a power concrete breaking division and a creative breaking division. So the ultimate breaking championship was the grand championship of those four divisions, basically. Whoever won the most of those and got the most points. So I won that title the first year they, had, they, they put that grand championship together in two. 2004 and then in 2005 I went in and uh, uh, I uh, uh, I was slated to repeat and defend that ultimate title so I went in and I made a strategic error early on and in power kicking I didn't you could you can hit twice so you can hit once and break and if you miss you get a second shot you only get two shots and uh, uh, it was uh, it had to do with the lightweights and the heavyweights. The lightweights had broken so many boards, uh, like the lightweight had broken like you know eight boards, and to win the lightweight division. And so he had the points, the uh, the points for the ultimate championship for the ultimate uh, title. And whenever I went to break, I only needed to break like seven to win the heavyweight title because all the guys that went before me kind of choked or didn't do well. So I broke my seven boards and I walked off of the stage and didn't do my second break. And I didn't realize when I did that, that I gave the points for the ultimate championship to the lightweight. So I went in, in 2005, the first division, and I put myself in a hole. I was behind. And as the, the day progressed and uh, we went through the rest of the divisions, when I did my creative breaking division, I broke my arm. I won the division. But I broke my own on my pinky side. And this is back, this again, this is still about my wife. So I walked off the back of the stage after creative breaking. I was behind in points because I had not taken my second hit in power kicking because I made a strategic error. And I'm sitting on the steps on the back of the stage. And my wife walks up and sits next to me. My guys, we had just cleared the stage. The cameras are going. It's a, it's a booming event. And I'm feeling sick to my stomach. And I said, babe, I think I broke my arm. And she said, how do you know? And I said, because I feel nauseous and I normally don't feel nauseous unless I break myself. And she said, are you sure? She said, no way, surely not. Well, I had hit one of my brakes wrong and I'd hit it up high on my, on my arm. So I got on the floor and I tried to hold myself in the position of a push up, and I couldn't hold up my own body weight. And I set up, I said, babe, my arm is broken. It's gotta be. So my wife sat next to me. This is the kind of wife I have. She sat next to me and she looked at me and she said, you have one more division. It's combat board breaking. It's breaking boards for eight seconds. She said, you can do anything for eight seconds. We're going to do this. And so we slid to the back. I sat in the corner and I iced my arm until the next division. The director allowed me to put one wrap of tape around my arm, and I went into my combat board breaking division. And the previous world record in that division was 27 boards, and I broke 36 with a broken arm. So my wife was there through the whole thing never gave me an out and believed in me in a way that pushed me to a level I'd never been at before. So, uh, that's just kind of a little story to relate to the importance and I think the uniqueness of my wife. Wow. That that's powerful. And that is, you know, I, I think if we take that story and couple it with the other kind of anecdote, the hypothetical of you buying the house next door, that probably tells us everything that we need to know about her and your relationship with her. Fiercely supportive, but yet knows you well enough to know what's important to you. 
Because what are most people going to tell their spouse when they break their arm? It doesn't matter. It's not that important. I just want you to be healthy, right? You know, things you know, like that. Absolutely. Jeremy, I laugh about that story sometimes when I share it with people. And I say, you know, honestly, when I sit down, I was feeling so sorry for myself with that broken arm. I was expecting a hug and a kiss and my wife to say, honey, I love you no matter what. This is not important. Let's just go home and be happy with what we've got. And she reached over. She hugged me and she just whispered in my ear. It's only eight seconds, and I know you can do anything for eight seconds. And that was it. That was the conversation. And I knew at that point I had to make that happen. But if I'm reading between the lines right, she wasn't saying that because that was important to her, but she because she knew it was important to you. Am I right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. She, she, she couldn't have cared less if I won, lost, or anything. I mean, she wants me healthy, obviously, like I want her healthy, but she didn't care about the win. She just knew what was important to me and she knew what I needed at that point. Yeah. And, you know, I, listeners, I, I hope everyone out there has or, or finds someone that supports them in that way because that's, to me, that's the pinnacle. Someone that makes you better and you make them better. And when we have her on, we'll, we'll hear if you make her better. I'm, I'm guessing so, though. Boy, I hope so. <laughs> let's let's talk about the people you've trained with if you yes sir had to pick one person you know and i and i want to take out that original instructor that you talked about the one that sat on you who who would you say has been the most influential person and actually it doesn't even have to be a, a martial artist who's been the most influential person other than your original instructor in your martial arts career Uh, I don't want this to be cliche, but I'm, I'm going to reach as deep as saying, uh, my, my parents, uh, if, since we're reaching outside of martial artists and, uh, my, my mom, uh, when I lost my eye at three years old, uh, I, I, I just try, I guess, kind of imagine you're three, you get hit in the eye with a, a welding or a complete accident. Nobody threw it. It was a freak thing where it fell through the uh, the whole of a floorboard of a truck and bounced off the pavement and actually hit me in the eye driving down the road. And so it was a real freak accident. I had to have three major surgeries. And as a three year old, I have close to 200 stitches inside my eye socket. And my, my mom is responsible for keeping me you know, comfortable and, and keeping me from scratching and itching and doing all these things the doctors say I can't do. And so during that time, I've, I've shared the story a couple of times and not many people will probably know, but my mom planted three really hugely important seeds in me, and I don't want know why they stuck and why I remember them, but I do. But she repeated three things to me all the time, and one of those was, first, you're a gift from God. Uh, second, you're going to be a different kind of man. And third, she told me, you're going to change the world. And she told me those three, three things over and over during that time that I was kind of a lap child, for lack of better words, because... I couldn't play outside. I couldn't run hard and do the things that I wanted to do as a young boy for a period of time. And so she delivered some pretty heavy messages into me that impacted me tremendously and, and who I hopefully have become. You know, it's not cliche at all. We've, we've heard that from time to time. You know, a lot of people have said that their parents were influential, instrumental even. And for some of us, it, you know, I started before I really knew what I wanted. My mother said, you should do this, or, or do you want to do this? I don't even remember how it went. And I said, okay, because I was four. Right. <laughs> but, you know, you mentioned your mother earlier. You know, we're, we're starting to get a picture of, of her and, and thus how you were raised, too. So it sounds like that influence carried through a lot more than just that initial piece. And, and most of our guests don't say that most of our, our guests it's not their parents or, or one parent that becomes that tremendously influential figure you know it's it's funny because uh i realize more every day as i get older how wise uh my my parents and, and my mom uh, really is and still is uh, just, just a, a phenom of of wisdom but yet uh uh you know, basically a high school graduate who uh, was a stay-at-home mom and chock full of good information if you just took the time to listen to her. 
If you could train with anybody, anybody at all, alive, dead, anywhere in time, anywhere in the world, who would you want to train with? That's a great question, Jeremy. I really, uh, I kind of struggle with that. And I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, this is going to sound bad. I'm going to go kind of back to my mom. When I was very young, my mom used to tell me this, and this is relevant to the question. She would say, son, I don't care how many zeros someone has on the end of their paycheck. I don't care how many letters they have after their name. And that's probably partly why I'm not a big title guy. I don't care about titles. Uh, she said, Every person you know and meet gets up every morning and puts their pants on one leg at a time, just like you. So she groomed that into me very heavily as a young man. The reason I say that is because when I get asked who would I want to train with or who would I want to spend time with, I, there, there are people that I would absolutely love to train with. I, but I'm not a, I don't want to, I don't know if this is sound arrogant. I'm not really a fanboy. I, I don't, I'm not like starstruck by anyone. And I've been very blessed to train with. Some, some pretty high level people. Uh, Mr. Bill Wallace is one of them, Mr. John Hackleman. And I've, I've spent some time with some great people on the mats at different times. And uh, so it's hard for me to answer that question because I don't really have anyone that I just go, wow, that's someone that I want to spend time with. In the realm of forms, I, I think of maybe John Chung. He's a form phenom, you know, that inspired me when I was younger. Uh, in jujitsu, I would love the opportunity to maybe spend some time with. Uh, you know, with uh, uh, Hoist Gracie or one of the Gracies, not because I would ever think I was as good as them by any means, because I'm not. I would just love to learn from them. Uh, you know, they're, they're a handful of people. Uh, I was a fan of Heel Cho. Uh, I read his books when I was younger, and I was really intrigued by his thought process on heavy bags and the way he used them in his training and some things like that. So, but uh, I, I hope that kind of answered that question. It does. And there, there's nothing wrong with, with not looking to the, the, top of a cultural pyramid and, and choosing who you want to train with in that way. You know, I, it admittedly, most of the guests that we have on do look at that, but I think that most of them are, aren't looking at it from, I want to train with this person because, because they're famous, but most of the folks that they mentioned, and, and I mean, you've mentioned two folks that we've had on the show. They're John Hackleman and, and Bill Wallace. And both, not only are they well-known, but they are well-known because they are very good. And there are things that they have developed that they teach very, very well. And I think it's Absolutely. the hallmark of a, a great martial artist to, one, be an eternal student, excuse me, but to look at where you could develop more. I mean, we, we could always make everything better, but... You know, where really are those gaps? And then to seek out the best instructors, not necessarily the most famous, to make you better in those ways. Absolutely, wholeheartedly agree. I, I do my best every day to live my life as a, um, as a martial artist in, in a way that I would want other martial artists to live their lives. You know what I mean? So, uh, again, it's it's not a fame thing at all. I, I You know, there are a few people out there that I'm intrigued by and would love to learn from and my, the reality is I, I do want to share this with you. Uh, I've been asked many times, you know, by people who look at me and say, okay, you've accomplished some things that see me in that, uh, in that light. And they will ask me sometimes, you know, what drove you or what made you good at what you do? And here's my honest answer back to them many times. It was my students. Uh, I don't know how many times as a young instructor, when I first took over my school, uh, and I began to develop some students who were coming up the rank who, you know, they're 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. And I'm, I'm lining that class up and I'm watching them move. And I'm thinking to myself, I've got to lead from the front. I've got to stay in front of those guys. And I've had some young guys that are rocket fast, kick like freight trains, can move so well. And it drove me. It drove me so hard to not let them down and to be that example leader that I, I would want to have in front of myself. And so I think many times in my life, I've been really driven as much as anything by the students that I lead. There's a openness in the way that you're saying that, that really resonates for me. Let's talk about competition. Yes, we, sir. We've heard a bit about competition and, you know, I know that just from our previous conversations and our emails that competition is important to you. And listeners, if you haven't put that together, 
then you were probably sleeping on at least part of the episode. Talk to us about competition. Talk to us about really all of it, the what and and why it's important to you, why you spend the time and, and the money investing in that part Absolutely. of your training. Absolutely. Uh, I'm a firm believer that iron sharpens iron. And I am a firm believer that uh, not everybody's going to be a winner. I am not a fan of uh, participation medals. Uh, and, and I don't say that lightly. I, I am a fan of people need to lose to learn how to win. And people need to lose to learn how to grow. And people need to learn how to – here's the reality, man. People are always going to lose no matter what you get into there's going to be a curve of learning that you're going to have to lose. We need to learn that losing, we need to learn how to handle losing. We don't need to have losing taken away from us. And so I think competition is massively important stuff, but I do want to say this, I want to qualify this with, I do not force my students to compete and I don't consider us a competition school or organization. Uh, we offer op uh, competition opportunities for our students. We encourage them to, to do it. But, you know, many times we have a 45-year-old mom who just wants to train for the self-defense and the health benefits she gets off the mat. I don't feel a need to press that person to compete. So we try to be very respectful of people's needs, desires, and what uh, I, we hope will serve them best in, in the world. And so, but I think that competition is massively important in our life. I think it's integral in our development uh, uh, as young adults moving into a, a adulthood. Uh, the, and, and again, I think the, the most important piece is, or one of the most important pieces is uh, learning how to deal with difficulty, learning how to problem solve your way through. When I lose, instead of walking away and giving up and crying about it, you know, absolutely, I'm going to have some emotions at that moment. That, that's acceptable. But we need to pick ourselves up quickly and say, okay, I wasn't the best man. I wasn't the best woman today. Reflect on that. What can I do to be better next time? And how can I not allow that to happen again? And so I think that competition is massively important, to be honest with you. Why did breaking, and, and maybe I'm making an assumption that's, that's unfounded. It seems that breaking is your <clears throat> passion, especially within competition. Is that, is that fair? Yes, sir. That's pretty fair. I, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a, another little story. By all means. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, I had, uh, in West Texas, I began in Taekwondo. My roots were in Taekwondo. I, I still consider myself, I'm, I'm very partial to Taekwondo in my heart, although we, we cross train in other styles and other ways. And, and I have no, I think all martial arts are amazing. I don't, I don't have a, Ooh, this is the best or that's the best. I'm not there at all. So with that said, uh, growing up in Taekwondo, Taekwondo was very competitive in Texas. Many of the Olympic champions, once it became an Olympic sport, have come out of Texas. It's highly competitive. So I began competing in traditional Taekwondo tournaments where there were forms and sparring. And that was just it. That's, that's all you had. There were no weapons, nothing like that. So uh, uh, I grew up competing there. In the late 90s, I wanted to challenge myself. I'd had my school for a few years as an owner. And I went and competed in some uh, uh, some some Taekwondo tournaments and Olympic style fighting and did pretty well. Went to the Olympic Training Center uh, and and participated in the uh, uh, Pan American Team Trials. I ended up breaking my hand in like my second or third fight. Uh, did very well, but had to pull out because I broke my hand. Uh, anyway, with that said, breaking the why breaking and where did that come from? I'm at my school one day. My wife was at home. She was getting ready to come to the school to help. And she calls me and she says, hey, this is before cell phone. She calls me, hey, I'm flipping through the channels and there is a breaking competition on TV. And I was, I enjoyed breaking and she knew that. And, and she said, I think based on watching this, this is something you need to do. And I, you know, of course was like, what do you mean a breaking competition? What are you, you talking about? Why should I do it? And she, she said, well, I'm watching these guys and I really think you would do well. And I said, okay, so call, see if you can figure out who sanctions it, where it's at, and how we get involved. And uh, uh, the other thing that I saw, and this was kind of the business side of me, is I saw an opportunity for some really good exposure, if I did well, for our brand and for impacting you know, people on a bigger scale than just a little town here in West Texas. 
And uh, so my wife reached out to the, the International Sport Karate Association, found the breaking director. Uh, at the time, I clipped together some old VHS tape videos of me breaking and testings and demonstrations sent to them. They called me back the next day and said, hey, we're, you're in. Come break. They uh, allowed 19 of us to break that year, and I was blessed to be one of them. Cool. And, and, and I will finish that with yeah. I got my butt kicked. Yeah, I got my butt kicked that year. And uh, uh, I was a little sad about it, but I owned it. I knew I didn't, I didn't do as well as I could have. I think I got like uh, fourth or fifth place out of 19. And I came home. I, uh, I, I got access to the video. I called a friend of mine who's a professional magician, and I said, will you do me a favor and come with us and tell me how I can be better? And so we started training right away. And uh, I had a friend help me analyze the video. And we dug deep and hard and uh, tried to improve how we present ourselves and how we perform and just kept going back, taking the kicking, but kickings and going back. So, Why a professional magician? Uh, probably just by chance. His two daughters were students of mine, and uh, I knew I had seen him perform. And when I sit back and I watched myself on the stage in front of the cameras, I wasn't really pleased with what I saw and the way that I presented myself, not, not in a really negative way. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, I just knew there was something missing. And so I asked him if he would look at it and give me some feedback and his initial feedback I thought was really great. Uh, he told me, he said, you know, you went too fast from break to break. The judges didn't have time to absorb what you were doing. And it was stuff that I had never thought of. And so as I began to listen to him, I thought, wow, this is powerful. And another another piece of that is is uh, you know I've competed against a lot of really amazing martial artists one time. And I want to stress one time because they show up once, they lose, and they never come back, and it's really sad. It saddens me that they don't see themselves as more valuable than that and understand the value of learning from that and coming back. As human beings, we tend to learn by making mistakes. I mean, that, that's how I've always seen it. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. If you're not making mistakes, then you're not pushing your boundaries, and you're probably not learning, not growing. And it seems yes, like it, it seems like you're you're embracing that. You know this this might be a good time to mention that. Excuse me. When we first started talking, you had sent me some videos of some breaking that you had done, and you know the listeners know. I mean, the guests that come on the show are a mix of folks that I reach out to, folks that reach out to us, and referrals from other people, you know, often previous guests. But you're the first person who I forgot I had seen to come on the show. And, you know, listeners, we're, we're going to put a bunch of stuff up on the show notes. If you're new to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's the website. You can find show notes for this for any other episode. And one of the videos that's going to be up there is something that I saw you do at the U.S. Open was that last year? Uh, yeah, if, if I know with, what you're talking with, about, with yes, the sir, it was uh, 2016. Yeah, yes, so, sir, that was 2016. July. 2016. I'm watching the U.S. Open coverage on ESPN two because it's martial arts on TV, and I, I feel that just I have to watch it. Even even if I'm even if I don't have time, I'm going to turn it on and go do something else because there's just a part of me that feels the need to support that. But one of the things I saw was, at the time for me, and I guess in, in hindsight still is cringeworthy, as I saw a gentleman put his shin through four baseball bats at the same time. I've seen people do one bat. I've heard of people doing two. I've never seen anyone do four. And then when you sent me those videos, I realized, oh, you were the man who made me cringe because it was your shin going through those four bats. <laughs> So I thought that was a lot of fun to to kind of connect that loop, so to speak. T tell us tell us about that. Tell us about that, you know, U.S. Open experience and four bats and some of your other uh, competition highlights. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so the last year I competed and won the World Ultimate Breaking Championship was 2008. And after that year, and that was the, kind of the comeback from the Achilles injury, I – I kind of made this mental decision that I, I didn't feel like I had anything to prove. Uh, and I, 
I had students that were coming up and becoming more competitive and I don't want to compete with my students. That's not the point. And so I began to pull away from the competition side. And so every now and then uh, the U S open would reach out to me and say, Hey, would you be willing to do something on the night stage uh, during the ESPN show? And, and absolutely honored by that. I would say, of course, and train myself as if I'm competing and go back and do it. And so what happens is, is uh, people that do, you know me see have seen me for several years doing a lot of baseball bat breaking from speed breaks to power breaks so all different kinds of baseball bat stuff and people ask me why why baseball bats well here's the honest reason because on the night show stage there are guys doing point fighting there's grappling there's forms there's weapons there are kids there are adults and i have the responsibility of getting on that stage in a timely fashion for the espn show out of respect to the promoters, out of respect to the ESPN fans, the actual timing of the actual television show and everything, get on the stage, set my material up very quickly, and do breaking that's considered world-class in a way that it doesn't leave a mess that gets someone hurt after me. And so baseball bats have been an easy way to do that. It's easy to set them up. It's easy to break, not easy to break them. I shouldn't say that, but easy to set them up, and it's easy to clean up after them. And so uh, I've done a lot of baseball bat breaking on the stage. And uh, last year, uh, a few years ago, I did three bats at one time. And so last year, they reached out to me and said, hey, are you interested in doing something again? And I said, absolutely. And I just had this kind of burning desire to go to four. And uh, I've seen a lot of people break one, two, and three. And, and now it's funny that I've done it. I have people send me video links to guys breaking all kinds of stuff, you know, and it's great. But uh, that's kind of the, the why of the baseball bats and where that kind of came from. Is, is there a physical limitation as to just the, the length of your shin and how many you would be able to do? Can you do five? I don't know. Uh, that's a, I, I will tell you this. Okay, so the baseball bats that I'm breaking, and I want to qualify this, are actual Louisville Slugger baseball bats that I buy either straight from Louisville Slugger slugger or i go down to my local sporting goods store and buy them off the shelf and and by the way i have a moral dilemma every time i do because usually when you buy those at the checkout they'll ask you if you want the warranty i always struggle with that journey it's like uh <laughs> should i take it <laughs> right anyway so with that said uh uh i tell you what man going from three to four was a huge difference i was kind of shocked by it personally uh i had hit three in the past and it was it felt relatively easy Hitting those four bats, I know I really haven't really talked with anybody about this, was like kicking a wall. It was crazy. So length of my shin, I don't know that I could get through five, to be honest with you, unless I set, set them up a different way. Uh, but yeah, l shin length is an issue, but I'm six foot three, so I've got long shins, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to do, do the math. You know, I'm, I'm looking at my tibia, right? That's, <laughs> that's the name of that bone, right? Um, yes, and sir. Just, and just trying to imagine... You know, and, and it looks like I can get my, my I can I'm pulling away from the mic. You can probably hear that, listeners. I think I might be able to fit two to three in there. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a smaller man, but I definitely don't have room for four unless I'm coming in at some kind of weird angle. Right. But you know right. that that's that's a big dramatic way of, of, of us saying you should watch this video. Um Master Chips of you know, an accomplished man, but also a humble man. So he, he's not really going to talk about how impressive this looks on television, but it was, it was great. And I want you to check it out. If you haven't checked it out, by all means do whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. We'll have that as well as a bunch of other stuff over there worth checking out. Let's shift gears now. And let's talk about yes, other things that are on TV or on screens. Let's talk about movies. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie? Do you, are, are you into martial arts? movies or tv at all uh very uh very little to be honest with you but i will tell you this as a kid in the late 80s i was i have to admit i was i think highly influenced by Bloodsport, the movie really i don't know i fell in love with that movie and i watched it over and over and over uh Van Damme's physique his flexibility just what i perceived at that time as amazing skills just blew my mind. So as a kid, yeah, I would say that movie influenced me a lot. Now I was already in martial arts when that movie came out. So, uh, it, but it would be a standout, but today it's so hard 
and I, I gosh, I hate saying this because I don't want it to come across wrong, but I find myself being uh, being uh, kind of critical. So when I see martial arts movies and I see the martial arts in the movies, uh, uh, I find myself being too critical of what they're doing as opposed to just enjoying the movie. So I don't really, I, I'm not like a big, ooh, I want to watch all the martial arts movies, if that, that makes sense. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh one of the things that we put out over social media, we, we, do, we do a bunch of memes and things like that. And I put together actually a couple, you know, you're a martial artist if lists. And one of them, uh, most of them came from my own life. One of them was, you know, you're a martial artist if you've ever been shushed in a movie theater for saying that wouldn't work. <laughs> yeah. right. Yes, yes. Re re remind, reminded me of that. Yeah, I, I think we all... Even those of us that are passionate about martial arts movies tend to ride a fine line between embracing the spectacle of it and yet maintaining a, a bit of a critical eye. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And that's not, that doesn't mean I don't enjoy movies with martial arts. I do, but I, I don't necessarily go hunting them down going, ooh, I can't wait for the next martial arts movie to hit. You know what I mean? Right. You mentioned Van Damme. Is there anybody else that, you know, when they're on screen, you you pay a little bit more attention or, or find their choreography to be a, a little bit more accurate? Uh, honestly, no. Uh, I But I will say this. Uh, uh, Taylor Lautner, who has been in several movies now, and that's some really good stuff. Yeah. I I find myself following some of those young guys. I'm good friends with uh, Caitlin Deschel, who uh, actually doubled for – the in the Wonder Woman movie that's coming out, mm -hmm. and I've known those guys since they were kids, uh, and because of that, I, I'm a fan of them, and I really enjoy getting to see them out there and see what they're accomplishing with their martial arts. That's so powerful for me because they're making an impact on a huge scale, uh, uh, and, and and I'm so proud for those guys. So I I do watch for those guys that I know. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and. I mean, obviously, two very accomplished martial artists that have turned their eye towards movies and um, two people that are, uh, we'll just say, are in the pipeline. I won't say any more than that. Yes, sir. <laughs> How Absolutely. about books? Are you, are you a reader? You a martial arts book reader? I am. Okay. I, I, I am. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, The Art of War, The Book of Five Rings, and... I haven't read them in years, but I've read all of those books and thoroughly enjoyed them. And the the timeless tr truths of leadership that you can uh, you can uh, uh, kind of pull out of those books. Whenever I was younger in my early, and I alluded to this earlier, I read several of uh, Heel Cho's books uh, on kicking and training and things like that. I really enjoyed those as a young person. So nowadays, most of my reading is around. Uh, uh, you know, personal development, business, and self -tell. I'm not like a, a fantasy book reader kind of guy. I try to, I for some reason, always think of book reading as function. So, Let's talk about what's keeping you going. You know, as we reflect back on everything that we've talked about today, you're a motivated person. I, I have no issue saying that. I don't know if you would accept that assessment, but it seems like you're always looking towards what's coming next or, or, or how else you can become better in some way. And it seems like that's a pretty big yes, part sir. of your personality. Yes, sir. So whenever I was a kid, uh, I have these vivid memories of my parents in general telling me that it was my responsibility as a young man to be better than the last generation. And that was their generation. And so they would tell me all the time, you know, we've done okay, but we want you to be better. You're supposed to be better. You're supposed to do better. And so I am highly driven. And I think part of that wiring, for lack of better words, came from that mindset that they kind of groomed into me as a young person. And my father was self-employed. So that lends itself to who I am today as a self-employed martial artist and, 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 uh, making my living from something that I love. Uh, but also I'm very driven in the fact that I have a responsibility not only to myself, but to God and my wife and my kids to be a provider, a protector and a preparer for them. 
And that's my job, and I'm highly driven by that every day. Do you have any goals that you'd, you'd be willing to articulate to us, you know, whether that's something very concrete like five baseball bats or, you know, something a little bit <laughs> fuzzier on the horizon? You know, I, I'm, I'm guessing it, as driven as you are, there are things that you have in mind that you're looking to accomplish. I'm wondering if you'd share some of those with us. Absolutely. First and foremost, I want to be debt free. <laughs> Just like every other, I think, red blooded American at some point, we want to be debt free. And we're, we're working towards that and getting close. Uh, we just rolled out a new instructional website, uh, which we can talk about anytime. But uh, I, uh, I have some goals for where I want that to go and what I want it to do uh, as far as generating revenue and, and uh, hopefully uh, creating uh, uh, a, 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 another platform to reach out and touch lives. Uh, but as far as like, I find that now that I'm 45, my, my focus is shifting less from how many bricks can I break or how many bats can I break or who can I beat in the sparring ring to more how can I help the people around me to accomplish those things and, and to do those things better themselves. So my goals now are to not be the teacher on the mat teaching 5, 10, 10, 50 kids on a mat but to be teaching 5, 10, 50 leaders leading 5, 10, and 50 each of their own. So those are my goals now to uh, multiply or exponentiate hopefully a, an, the impact that I'm, I'm hoping that we're having. And I try to say that with some humility. I, I, I don't want that to come across wrong because uh, our goal is to touch lives in as positive way as possible and make people's lives better. Uh, but my goals are shifting, again, from a physical, I can break this, do that, to how many lives can I touch and help them to touch more lives? This is a perfect time to talk about that, that website and, you know, the programs that you've got, you know, let, let us know, let us know what's going on. I mean, we, we've heard a lot about you and I'm sure the listeners would love to know how they can connect with you and learn more about what you got going on. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, the easiest way to connect with me and I try to, I handle most of my own messaging, most of all of my own stuff for the most part uh, is through uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook slash the you know dot com slash the Chip Townsend. So if you want to look me up there, that's great. We just rolled out a website. Uh, we're it, it's we're calling it a fully comprehensive instructional breaking website. It has two areas. One area is geared towards anybody that's just interested in breaking, bettering their breaking skills, all the way from you know, man, Jeremy, through the years in breaking, I've learned a lot of things the hard way, how to pick material, how to hold material, how to hit things and not to hit things and how to team hold and how to hold for speed breaks and just so much stuff. And so we just released a, a website with about 80 videos so far, and we'll be adding videos to that that covers everything from the most basic, simple breaks to how to choose your material, how to set it up, how to be safe in breaking, how to use breaking as a success tool in your martial arts school how to use it as a motivation tool. You know I mean? Think it's, there are sections of it that you can kind of almost think Anthony Robbins and like the firewalk, you know, when done well, it's so inspirational. Uh, but anyway, the, the website is called break like a champ.com. Just break like a champ.com. So. Okay, great. And listeners, if you're in the car or something, you know, I don't, I don't want you to risk death or injury to write these things down, you know, show notes. We'll have them all over there for you. <laughs> I appreciate your time here today. And I'm wondering, might you send us out with some parting words of wisdom? Absolutely, Mr. Jeremy. I will do my best, my friend. I first want to say thank you so much to you and your listeners for giving me this opportunity. And second, I want to encourage people that uh, no matter how dark things get, it's going to get light. No matter how bad things feel, there's a golden nugget. And the last thing is, if you're a martial artist, you should be training all day, every day, not just 30 minutes on the mat or 45 minutes. You're training. I, my mom used to chew on me for walking on the sides of my shoes because I was practicing my side foot kick foot control uh, all the way from flipping light switches on and off with my toes and kicking leaves off of the, the her favorite ivies in the house. But my point is this. You can always be training and always be bettering yourself. One of my favorite things about this show is the motivation I receive from our guests. 
Master Chip left me anxious to tackle my goals, both inside and outside training. I hope you got as much out of today's episode as I did. Thank you, Master Chip, for coming on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, we've got the show notes with quite a few photos, links to video of his amazing four-bat break, his website, social media, and a ton more. Check it out. Find us on social media. We're all over the place. Name it. We're probably there. And we've also got a great Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. If you have a great idea for a new or improved traditional martial arts product, let us know. We're all about helping move things forward. Thanks for being here today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.